Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 14 of the Inkwell Gamers podcast. Today we're going to be talking about a pretty popular concept in TCGs, who is the beatdown? And so because this concept has been around for so long and I don't have as much experience in TCGs as Dalton does, I want to be taking a step back and handing the reins over to Dalton to walk us through this concept. Are you ready for today's episode? Yeah, I'm really excited about today's episode. This concept was very formulative for my trading card game career, mm -hmm. if you could call it that. So what we're the concept we're talking about is who's the beatdown? This is a very famous Magic the Gathering article written by Mike Flores about 24 years ago. And this is a concept that translates very well through a lot of different TCGs whether you've played Magic, Hearthstone, and definitely it translates into Lorcana. The concept is essentially this. Knowing your role and your game plan for your specific deck in every specific matchup, but most specifically the matchups against decks that have very similar game plans to yours. In every game of Lorcana, there will be one player who is supposed to be the aggressor and then one player who is not. So in this situation, the beatdown is the more aggressive player. And if you read Mike's article, he is talking more strictly in a deck versus deck sense and not necessarily talking about specific situations or even the different metrics that legitimately matter in that specific matchup. For, so there are some caveats. Yeah, so there are definitely some caveats, okay? So in a lot of true mirrors, let's say... Ruby Amethyst Control versus Ruby Amethyst Control. Being the beatdown could mean generally who just went first in the game because that player has less resources over the long term because they don't get to draw a card their first turn and they also get the ability to quest first generally so they're much more likely to have a little bit more assertive of a game plan as opposed to a reactive game plan. Mm -hmm. The beatdown is also dependent on the current game state, you know, maybe you would call it the status quo, and who needs to change the status quo. If you're in a Ruby Amethyst deck versus another Ruby Amethyst deck, but you have Magic Mirror out, you might not be winning in lore count. Maybe they have a Pongo out. But that is not necessarily the metric in which the game is going to be won over the long term because you're going to constantly be able to draw cards and outdraw your opponent, therefore running them out of resources so as long as they don't also draw a magic mirror in the near future. Because the Pongo most likely is just going to not get to 20 lore by itself. It'll hit, get hit by a Goofy, a dragon fire what have you, or get caught up in a be prepared, and then because you have drawn more cards with the Magic Mirror, you'll eventually take over the game at some point. So, can we take a step back here for a second? Yes. Okay, so going back to just like the nitty gritty of the concept of the beatdown. So you said that we have one player who's the aggressor and one player who is not, and so I'm presuming that that's like the controller. So the aggressor is trying to win as quickly as possible. Whereas the other player is trying to drag the game out longer to hopefully buy enough time to win themselves, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. And so if we're talking about... In, in a general sense, In I a general say. sense, of course. We're talking about this in a vacuum, mm -hmm. right, for now. I know that you said that you just went over caveats, but... So in a traditional sense, if we're thinking about an aggressive deck versus a control deck, aggressive would be kind of like, I guess, mine with Emerald being mm -hmm. like my main color. So I Emerald Amethyst right now. And then you've traditionally played the Ruby Amethyst control deck. And so traditionally, I would be the aggressor or the beatdown, and then you would be the control trying to bide your time to win, correct? Yes, this is kind of the, the level one of it. You have the aggressive deck versus the control deck. Mm -hmm. The aggressive deck wants to win, and as 
make the game go as few turns as possible mm -hmm. because the longer the game goes, the better chance the control deck has to cast their more expensive, more impactful spells and or cards and take over the game. Right, which makes sense because Emerald has a bunch of high questing characters and then Ruby has a bunch of removal, either characters or spells to try to wipe the board. So then what you started talking about with like a mirror match, now you have two control decks. And so ultimately one has to take the role in how they play the game to become the aggressor over the other control, correct? Yes. So a really good example of this is kind of the Ruby Amethyst mirror. If you are playing a mirror match and you only have one magic mirror in your deck, but your opponent has two or a three, they're probably going to want to be the control deck because they're going to draw their magic mirror more often. They're going to be able to use it more often, therefore accumulating more cards over the long game. So your game plan should not be to play the long game against them because they're drawing more cards you're just going to lose so you have to take that more aggressive stance so mm -hmm. deck selection and deck building are really important elements in who the beatdown is especially for true mirrors like that example or even just controlling mirrors maybe the one that we're getting ready to talk about first which is ruby amethyst versus amber sapphire okay does that make sense yes okay so I do want to go into this example. So both of these are control decks with a similar game plan of wanting to drag the game out as long as possible, right? You have Elsas and Ursulas and Magic Mirrors and Maleficents in one deck. And then in the other deck, you have the Sapphire Hades, the Amber Hades loops that you can do. You have Stitch Carefree Surfer, you have Rapunzel's, you have Let It Goes. So you, and each deck has a lot of removal and a lot of card draw. Thus, that tends to them both wanting the game to go longer. Now, the difference is, is that the Ruby Amethyst deck generally has more card draw because they have Magic Mirrors. And they have more removal because they have Be Prepared, Maui's, Rafiki's. Dragonfire. Dragonfires. <laughs> big and, dragon. <laughs> and big, big Maleficent dragon. Yeah. So their deck generally is going to be favored in the long game. And that is also accentuated with the fact that Let It Go and Hades are also not great in the mirrors because you're given that opponent an extra resource by inking the character that you're removing mm -hmm. right so what this ultimately means is that if you are going to a tournament and you are the amber sapphire deck and you know that ruby amethyst is going to be one of the most played decks or popular decks because it is an extremely strong deck in and of itself mm -hmm. you need to know how to play against that deck and have a specific game plan for that deck so that might mean to have specific tech cards in your deck for that matchup now what is sorry for people who are listening who might be new to tcgs what is it what do tech cards mean so a tech card is essentially a card or subset of cards in your deck that are meant for certain matchups to make that matchup better for you. Mm -hmm. So if you know you're going to be playing a lot of Amethyst Ruby decks and you know that you're going to have to be the more aggressive deck just because you know you can't play a long game against them, maybe you want to in increase that a little bit more by playing cards like LeFou Bumbler or Mickey Mouse True Friend because these are both inkable cards that you can uh, reasonably play against the aggro decks. They're not necessarily great against the aggressive decks, but they're at least cheap cards, cheap bodies. Mm -hmm. But they really do shine against some of the other control mirrors because they're just cheap characters that can help enable your aggressive game plan by questing early. Okay, so, you know, there are some other cards also that you might want to include in this deck. That could be Aurora Regal Princess. That is probably just a better one than LeFou Bumbler. And then you can even include 
the shift aurora to help give your more important characters ward later in the game but also that translate into a bigger body that can challenge into some of the aggressive decks a little bit better as well maybe you want to try donald duck straying his stuff because that is a threat that is not the easiest to remove from ruby amethyst because it can't get dragon fired it can't be maleficent did and they can't target it with elsa they can only really crash into it with maui or rafiki so that has some limited answers to it and it's an aggressive character as well because it can quest for a lot so those are the kinds of things that you have to think about when you're building decks specifically and when you're trying to come up with a game plan against decks that are similar than yours but you might not have a great matchup because of how the decks generally line up against each other. Because mm -hmm. I know that when you were still playing Ruby Amethyst, you anticipated that mirror match going into a tournament. And so I remember you telling me that you had made specific changes to that deck in anticipation of that. Yes, yes. I played a heavy evasive package in my deck because I wanted to be the aggressive deck in the mirrors. I really didn't want to play these long games that took 30 minutes to play and then go to time even though I did um <laughs> I I wanted to actually be able to be the more assertive player and win win the game uh when I played the mirrors and I also wanted to have some cards that could help me become aggressive against the aggressive decks when it was appropriate so I liked including the evasive package and into that as well so essentially for the amber sapphire deck what it really comes down to is do you know your deck's role in that matchup right if you try to play this extremely long game and your opponent has a magic mirror sitting in play and they just get to draw an extra card every turn you're going to fall behind turn after turn after turn in the metric that really matters in this match and what i mean by that is yes the goal for pretty much every deck is to get to 20 lore right? right but in a lot of controlling matchups your lore total isn't necessarily the metric that matters until the very very end Mostly it'll be about card draw and denying your opponent's drawing cards. A very savvy Ruby Amethyst player is going to know that the Amber Sapphire deck is going to have Stitch Carefree Surfer in their deck. So they will basically never want them to have two characters in play at a time in fear of Stitch Carefree Surfer coming down because that's probably the best card in the matchup for the Amber Sapphire deck because it draws some cards and it's a pretty hard to deal with body. So the Ruby Amethyst's deck whole goal is to keep Amber Sapphire's board clear through all of its removal so they can't draw cards from Rapunzel and Stitch Carefree Surfer. What that really lends itself to is that Ruby Amethyst wants the game to go as long as possible and Magic Mirrors are really good at enabling that and the Amber Sapphire deck just doesn't have the tools necessarily to keep up with that kind of late game. They don't have the be prepared style cards for when they get really far behind. Their uh, single target removal cards and let it go in Hades actually give the Ruby Amethyst deck more ink to work with so that they can continue to draw cards or they don't have to ink their threats as much in the late game. So they need to try to be more aggressive and I think building your deck in a way to be more aggressive is also really important. So that's why you see a lot of these decks play Maleficent Uninvited, the five cost mm -hmm. Maleficent, because it quests for three, and that is the kind of card that can end the game for them in kind of short order if it's left unattended. The opposite is true for Ruby Amethyst. For most Ruby Amethyst decks, if they're trying to go into this matchup being the aggressive deck it's just not gonna work out for them they have a lot of the times four guests on and some number of magic brooms and maui's and 
these cards just aren't very good at applying pressure in the way that it matters in the control mashup matchups because Gaston and Maui can't actually quest. The Magic Brooms quest for one, but a lot of the times they're just better as ink so you can make sure you play your Maleficence on time and your Ursula's on time, those kinds of things. And if you're trying to be the aggressor in this matchup, you're also playing into your own be prepared. If you play out three characters and they have a Maleficent uninvited that's kind of just threatening you and you don't necessarily have a dragon fire for it, then be prepared is going to take care of a lot of your characters too and that's just not going to work out well for you. You're trying to extend the game and you're just losing resources in that scenario. Now, if you play out Archimedes and Aladdin Street Rat early, you're just kind of doing yourself a disservice because you're not really going to be able to threaten a lot of their early cards. You're not going to have the ink for late in the game and uh, they'll be able to take advantage of that. A good gameplay example of who the beatdown is is this. Let's say your opponent has Maleficent uninvited in play. They have five ink, Maleficent, some random number of cards in their hand, and maybe seven, eight lore already. And you are sitting there with a Goofy and a Dragonfire in your hand. Which one should you play? Now, Goofy does play to the board, but it's not actually very good at playing to the board because it doesn't challenge Maleficent very well at all, nor does it race Maleficent at all because they're gaining three lore, you're only gaining two. The play that I would make probably 99% of the time is just to drag and fire the Maleficent. Like I said, your whole game plan revolves around making the game go longer. If you play Goofy, that's kind of you wanting to make the game go shorter because you're prioritizing you getting lore over you making sure your opponent's not getting lore. Mm -hmm. right? You gotta clear the path before you can start yeah. questing yeah. first. You gotta you gotta try them run try to run them out of resources before you get to the point where you want to take that aggressive stance against them. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. These scenarios also come up when you have two similarly aggressive decks playing against each other. Say one person is playing a Stitch Rockstar Steel Song variant and the other one is playing your favorite deck, Dana, Emerald Amethyst Tempo. Okay? Heck yeah. Now, which one do you think should be the beatdown in this matchup? Mine. Why do you say that? Because I have high questing characters and so I'm going to want to take the more aggressive approach. Yes, that is partially true, but also it's important to recognize that your characters just aren't good when you're playing defense, whether it's Cheshire Cat, Mad Hatter, Kuzco, Flynn Rider. If you're not questing with those cards, then you're probably not winning the game, right? Because challenging with a five ink cost two power mad hatter generally just doesn't get it done right 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 so you want the game to go as short as possible whereas the steel song deck they have tinkerbell they have grab your swords mm -hmm. they have smashes sometimes they have fire the cannons a bunch of cards that are trying to interact with you to make sure you don't get to 20 lore as fast as possible and the steel song deck can really be a pretty aggressive deck also but in this matchup they're definitely the control deck for most of the game mm -hmm. so yeah i was right yes you're right <laughs> yes yeah the emerald amethyst deck a lot of its cards just don't work appropriately unless you're being aggressive and there are some cards that i know you don't like mother knows best but that is a card specifically that if you're not trying to win fast, it is also not good because it's card disadvantage. You're just discarding a card to bounce a card back to their hand so they get to keep the card, whereas you lose yours. You're just paying your card for their time, essentially. Mm -hmm. So if you want the game to go longer, that's not the most effective card in longer games as well. 
The Steel Song deck also has a lot of card advantage. A lot of times they have Stitch Rockstar, which can draw them a lot of cards. Grab Your Swords is oftentimes like virtual card advantage because it's going to take out one or two of your characters, especially in combination with Tinkerbell. Mm -hmm. Very annoying. Very annoying. That has yep. happened. <laughs> yeah, so... I can attest to that. So they'll out card advantage you. They'll out removal you if you give them enough time. So... Yeah, you, you definitely are the beatdown deck. But at the same time, I think it's also important to note that these roles of being the beatdown or not can also switch in the middle of a game. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it just stresses me out. <laughs> <laughs> me too, me too. For example, in the scenario, the matchup that we were just talking about, Mm -hmm. For a large portion of the game, the Steel Song deck is going to be the control deck. They're trying to stop you from doing what you're wanting to do, quest in high, high amounts. But there comes a shift towards maybe the middle or the end of the game where they also have to start getting a little more aggressive, okay? Because maybe you're at 17 lore already and all you need to draw is a Kuzco because that's the one thing that they can't really answer and just quest with it one time and you'll end up winning the game. So they have to shift roles to be the aggressive deck to try to put as much pressure on you to find answers to them be before you draw your Kuzco, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's just because they land a Stitch Rockstar and now they're able to draw a bunch of cards and put a bunch of characters in play and that enables them to start to race you in a favorable way for them. Yeah, it can get out of control real quick, mm -hmm. I've noticed in some of my games. Yeah, the, the one tough part about the Emerald Amethyst deck is that it does not do a good job of switching roles in this way because almost all of its characters are better when they are questing. And that's the only time they're super effective at doing anything. Uh, Flynn Rider, if you have to challenge an opposing character with that, you're pretty sad. And Cheshire Cat does not challenge at all. <laughs> right. Uh, that's why Meg is a pretty important piece of this deck, I think. But in general, it just does not play well when it's behind. But I do want to continue talking about roles and how they change and kind of how you know when they've changed because recognizing it is a very important key to this whole thing, right? So let's say we're talking about the Ruby Amethyst mirror match, okay? Mm -hmm. And your opponent is playing an evasive package. They're heavy on Pongos and Goofies, maybe. And they have a Pongo and a Goofy in play, and they're just questing away. They're getting to a decently high lore total, maybe 10 or so. And then you cast Be Prepared, your opponent is halfway to the lore count and they are effectively beating you down. They have the more aggressive version of the deck. Next turn, they play another Goofy, let's say. Then on your turn, you play a Magic Mirror and a Dragonfire on that Goofy. Next turn, they play Aladdin. On your turn, you draw a card and seeing friends on the other side, maybe on their turn they quest with Aladdin. So while they're still getting ahead on board, you're starting to change the status quo because you're able to draw cards with Magic Mirror. So you're starting to enable your game plan. As soon as you draw a Maleficent for their Aladdin, you start to really take over the game in this scenario because you've already started drawing more cards than your opponent. Your opponent's not gonna be able to keep up because they, chances are they've dedicated so many slots in their deck to the evasive package that they're just not gonna have as much removal or card draw options. So once they start running out of steam and just playing one character a turn and then you're able to remove that one character and draw extra cards, you have effectively become the beat down in this scenario because now you're enacting your game plan. Okay. So what you want to think about in each game is 
Am I enacting my game plan? If I'm not, how can I enact my game plan? And what do I need to do to stop my opponent from enacting their game plan, right? Mm -hmm. And as soon as you feel that start to slip and you're no longer doing what your deck's supposed to be doing, for instance, if you're Emerald Amethyst, as soon as you start to challenge your opponent's characters with your Tinker Bells or what have you, you have already fallen behind, mm -hmm. generally, right? Because you have now decommitted from your game plan mm -hmm. of just questing with your characters until they can't quest anymore in order to stop your opponent from doing whatever it is they're doing. They have become the beatdown effectively because now you're trying to stop them from en enacting their game plan. Does they, that make sense? Yeah, they put me in a position in which I had to abandon being the beatdown. Although I, I don't want to, but... It was, maybe you have to. I have to. Yeah, maybe you have to. So it's really key to know when those scenarios are, are coming up for you and when that switch is taking place. If you can't identify when that switch is taking place, then you're probably going to lose the game. If you just keep questing along when your opponent is ahead in lore and you're not trying to challenge them, then... <laughs> you're just you're just gonna lose right mm -hmm. like if you're not challenging their board and you're trying to quest with your flynn riders or what have you then the chances are you're just not going to get there if you're trying to play a long game against the deck with the magic mirror in play chances are they're going to outdraw you and you're just not going to gonna get there so it's really important to know why the cards that are in your deck are in your deck what matchups they're for and how all of this connects to knowing your role in each specific matchup, as well as knowing when your role changes in that matchup in order for you to kind of get back on track. Does that make sense? Yes, of course. Okay. Yeah, everything you've talked about today has honestly made a lot of sense. I feel like I didn't quite understand this concept previously playing casually, um, like Pokemon and Magic with you. But since I am immersing myself more in this and I'm trying to understand the cards that I'm putting in my deck and how it might interact with other cards I'm facing, applying this concept to them and hearing these specific examples being applied to the beatdown concept has really helped to give me a good strategy when going into competitive matches. Yeah, and you know, even in Pokemon, I can give you an example that you'll understand right away. You remember the card Boss's Orders? Yes. If you have to Boss's Orders your opponent's random bench Pokemon just so you don't die, mm -hmm. then you are not the beatdown. <laughs> <laughs> then you are not the beatdown. That's a good point. You are not the beatdown. If if your boss is ordering their... That's a Hail Mary. Yeah, their, I don't know, their benched... Badoof. Badoof or whatever, <laughs> just so they can't uh, kill your Pokemon on their turn, then you've, you've probably lost. They, they are, in fact, the beatdown. Good to know, good yeah. to know. <laughs> Awesome. <clears throat> All right. I think that wraps it up. I hope that you guys have taken something away from this. I know that there's a lot of information here. And if you have any kind of questions, you can comment to us in our Discord or on Twitter or X. And I would love to be able to try to answer those for you. Mm -hmm. It's a very nuanced discussion, too, because... A lot of things are situational as well, but... This is something he really finds joy in, trust me. So if you want to strike up a conversation about this, he can talk all day with you about it. Yeah, I, I do enjoy this and I enjoy talking to you guys as well. So if you have any questions, please reach out. Do you have anything else, Dana? No, just aside from that, if you are still interested in finding yourself a starter deck, we have one more to give away, so we're still doing that. Only thing that is involved with that is once we reach 100 followers on Twitch, 
we will draw names from whoever comments in our giveaway channel on Discord. So if you want a chance to win our last starter deck, make sure you follow us on Twitch and join our Discord for the giveaway channel and comment in there. And so once we hit that, we'll we'll draw again. But aside from that, I think that's it. Dalton's going to continue to post videos about online tournaments he's competing in on YouTube. So if you're interested in seeing him in action, be sure to check out our YouTube channel as well. Yeah, also we will have a link to the original article in our bio. So please go check that out if you're interested. It is maybe a little bit dated being 24 years old, but I think there's still a lot of good information in there. So, so check it out. For sure. And with that being said, that wraps up our episode. We hope you guys have a good week and we'll talk to you next week. Have a great week, guys.